Welcome to Hibbert Health. Hello, Dr. Stolman. Thank you for joining me today. Dr. Stolman is a world-renowned expert on the microbiome as it relates to caring for patients with common and unusual digestive diseases and disorders. He is notably the world's expert in C. difficile and fecal microbiota transplant, FMT. Yes, that's fecal transplant. Also, diverticular disease. He does a lot of work with H. pylori, acid reflux disease, GI bleeds, colitis, eosinophilic and Barrett's esophagitis. Dr. Stolman is chairman of the Division of Gastroenterology at Alta Bates Summit Medical Center in Oakland, California. He is an associate clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He is currently chairman of the Board of Governors for the American College of Gastroenterology and is on the Board of Trustees. As a director of East Bay Center for Digestive Health, Dr. Stolman conducts and publishes clinical research. He has authored several book chapters and research articles. He is a frequent speaker and teacher at national meetings and training programs. Dr. Stolman got his medical degree at NYU in New York City. He specialized in internal medicine at Columbia University and fellowship in gastroenterology and advanced endoscopy at University of Miami. He lives and practices in Oakland, California. Dr. Stolman, please take us into your world of the microbiome and share with us many of your aha moments with your research, your work, and your patients. We're very interested to hear about that. Sure thing, Dr. Hibbert, and, and thanks, thanks for having me on. That intro is uh, way too long. I, I'm a relatively nice guy and a father of two nice kids and been working at universities and VAs, and now I'm largely in private practice, but I still have an academic appointment. I actually still do a lot of research. I wasn't really a biome person until, I actually remember very well, it was about 11 years ago. I got a phone call from a woman in Seattle, Dr. Chris Sowerts, who's sort of the godmother of C. diff, one of really America's leaders in the world of C. difficile or C. diff, the bug that, that we're going to talk about, largely because it's the bug we treat with fecal transplants. So uh, she called me or emailed me, I forget which, but it was a while ago and said, hey, listen, uh, she gets a lot of emails. People find her because she's an expert. Uh, so this woman who's, uh, I still keep in touch with actually, she's a teacher, and she'd been emailing with Dr. Sorowitz with this really horrible case of C. diff. And Dr. Sorowitz said, this, this woman needs a, a fecal transplant, which Dr. Sorowitz had never done, actually. In fact, very few people had done. No one west of Mississippi had ever done. So Chris called me and said, listen, there's this lady. Will you, you know, will you fix her? And I said, sure, but how do I fix her? And she said, well, I think you should do a, a poop transplant on her, a fecal transplant on her. And I, I'm not sure if I laughed out loud, but I, I certainly said, what? Uh, you know, uh, anyway, she kind of convinced me and, uh, and I've not done them. She's not done one. And I brought this woman in. I had to go through some lots of bureaucracy at the hospital because the hospital, of course, said, you want to do what? You know, I said, no, I'm going to put some, here's this patient. I'm going to put some poop inside her. And the hospital said, no, you're not. Um, lots of paperwork later. And my goodness me, she was fixed. This is a woman who'd been sick for a year or so, and she was just radically, radically better. I sort of scratched my head and said, what's that about? And then Dr. Storch probably sent me a couple more because, again, she's kind of this funnel point that everyone found. So she sent me two or three patients, and the next thing you know, I'm up to 10, not a giant number. And she then started doing them. I actually did it before she did, even though she's clearly the, the real leader in this field. And... She started doing some, and a year goes by, and we now have 22, actually. Between the two of us, we have 22 patients, and we said, well, we should write this up, because who the heck's ever done this? Did you cure every one of them? It was about 80%. And interestingly, there's now been tens of thousands of these, I mean, literally tens of thousands of them, and there's data on, on many thousands of them. And, and in almost every data set, the rate is about 85 to 90%. And we really wrote it up in large measure for the methodology. It wasn't a randomized trial. Our intent was not to say, does this work or doesn't this work? We did it to everyone, and it did work. But it was really to tell people how to do it. In, in, in large measure, it was kind of a primer on just how, how you're going to give someone poop, at least colonoscopically, which is the way we were going to do it. So that went a little further, and we wrote that up in 2011, I think a decade ago. And then there was a group of five of us, there's a woman at Brown, another uh, doctor in New York, and another doctor in Oklahoma City. And the five of us said, well, we're all doing this. Let's put our patients together now. And now there's 75 patients, which 
it seems quaint in retrospect, but at the time was was a real number. It was 75 people that we did uh, did this on. I think. But uh, all these people did well, and they stayed well if they didn't get more antibiotics. Again, this is a, this is an illness that's caused largely by antibiotics, and these people were fixed as long as they didn't get more antibiotics. They stayed fixed, and they were doing well. And then things move fast out of our hands, of course. And then you know at some point we get a stool bank happening, and and uh, so I was the first user of the stool bank. I, so these kids out of MIT, they're going to yell at me for calling them kids, but but they're brilliant young adults and had this really incredible idea of a way to get stool to everyone. How do you do this? And they started to create this or this nonprofit organization called, called Open Biome. And we had an email list of sort of all the people around the country that were doing this, which wasn't many, it was 20 or 30, it was a small-ish number. And someone said, oh, by the way, on this email list, there are these, there's this stool bank and they're gonna try to sell stool to America. Is, isn't that an interesting thing? Simultaneously, I get a patient, at this point I probably treated 50 patients or 75 patients or 100 patients, somewhere in that, in that ballpark. And I get this, I remember her very well, this amazing little old lady, she's well into her 90s and sharp as a tack, super together, and she lives in a nursing home and she had this same illness that, that we're talking about. These are all for one illness, this C. diff. And what we've been doing before the stool bank was you had to bring me a donor. I'm not your stool donor. My, my staff are not your stool donor. It was almost always a, an intimate part. And in fact, in that first case, it was her husband. The premise being that they're kind of sharing life anyway. So probably, and we tested that, the, the husband for all sorts of things, but um, we didn't think his stool was a radically greater risk for her than being intimate with him. This woman is 90 something. She's in a nursing home. She has no one. She has outlived her relatives incredibly with it together. It's not like some, I don't mean to make her sound old. She's old, but she was spectacular, but she had no one. She just had, there was no one for her to ask. And she was saying, Dr. Solomon, can you be my donor? And I can't. There's ethical, there's all sorts of biologic and ethical reasons why that's not an option. And then that day, sort of, I get an email that crosses my, my computer saying, hey, there's these people in, in, in Boston who, are, who have poop. And I go, aha, there's an aha for you. But yeah. wait a minute. Got, I've got Estelle up on the ninth floor of the nursing home, and these kids say they can get me poop, and Estelle needs poop. So I emailed them right away and said, said uh, and, and no one knew what to make of them, a stool bank? What, what, what kind of crazy concept is that? We have blood banks and, I suppose, organ banks and bone banks and things like that, but certainly did not have a stool bank to, to date. I emailed them and said, listen, I think it sounds like what you're doing is, is a great idea, and and sign me up. I, here's my lady and she needs it. You know, it's five, about five and a half years ago now. And they put it on dry ice and they sent me the stool and I did this fecal transplant on this 90 something year old woman. And of course it works. It, it works in, in my hands. I think it's, I'm well over 90%. It's probably 95% of the, of the right patients. Uh, and anyway, this wonderful little old woman was, uh, was cured and thus begins the stool bank era which is, we can talk about COVID, but is suspended right now because of COVID issues. But all of a sudden that kind of democratized things in a sense. It took, it took a few years for them to ramp up, but in five plus years, they've now um, delivered 50,000 or more than 50,000 treatments. So, so number one, that, you know, what came out in Oakland, California, so Oakland, um, we're now over 50,000, not me, that's not me, that's, that's everywhere. Oh, but you're uh, numero uno. <laughs> you're numero uno, you absolutely are, I'm proud, I'm proud to say that. So uh, I mentioned COVID, that's the, uh, you know, current problem, of course, is that COVID can be found in stool, COVID can be identified in stool. There's legitimate questions about, does that mean anything? Is that a pathway into our body? It might be, is that a cause of illness in us? Is that a mode of transmission? But it's in stool, so all of a sudden I can't put stool in someone. Mm -hmm. And stool bank has, has a, a stop at the moment. I have a whole bunch of people kind of circling the airport waiting for the runway to get plowed so we can so they can they can land. Um, and that's okay for a while because you can temporize these people somewhat, but uh, but not not perfectly so. So that's kind of my, my journey. And again, now I'm, I'm, I'm a guy in practice in Oakland. I'm not a Harvard, Stanford, million dollar grant lab guy. That's not who I am at all. I'm a working doctor. I, I take care of, like you do, I take care of patients daily. That's, that's what I do. And because I was early and we published some of this stuff early, I, I have stayed involved in this field. I do publish more. I was the first person to publish on, on some pills, some poop pills, little, little frozen poop pills or crapsules as we sometimes uh, them and we wrote up a, again a very early report of uh, 
the f first five patients that we use these frozen poop pills with. That's something that you're using or currently administering? Pills are, no, pills are available now in, in a number of different venues, actually. Yeah, pills seem to work, and that's part of our, our pivot. Pills would be much easier than doing a colonoscopy. That's not cost-effective. It's invasive. There's some risk to the procedure proper. You're not scaling this up. It works for my patients, these little people who are sick. That's not a scalable solution for the country or the world, right? The, the right solution to be a pill. Those pills were frozen pills. We're going to get freeze dried, lyophilized, you know, home. There is no pill that a patient can take at home right now that doesn't exist, but there are pills that physicians can administer. So there's no, there's no home pill. I can't write a prescription for boot pills, but we do fecal transplants still colonoscopically, but also via pill. And pill probably doesn't work as well as colonoscopy, but it works. It works reasonably well and uh, is far, far better, right? You can, if, if your choice is swallow 30 pills or have a colonoscopy, most people are gonna swallow the pills. Equal material as a therapy for an illness is a crazy, crazy thing. And it, I think it's incredibly fortunate that we chose this bug C. diff first, and that was kind of this proof of concept, right? Because there's sort of this micro and this, this mega. The micro is, here's the disease, C. difficile. That's a bad disease and kills people. I'm not minimizing disease. It's still a very small thing on the scale of the world, this one disease. But this is the one disease, we, and still the only disease for which we have a, a data set that says you can cure this disease with fecal transplant. There's no other disease yet. We want that to be true for a whole number of other diseases like colitis and autism and a million other things. So thank goodness we kind of chose this thing to prove that it worked and we're helping people and not hurting people. And that's super important and that's my career. But I think there's a much bigger meta here, which is the sort of construct that you can alter someone's biome and cure an illness. Can you promote health by doing that? That's a whole nother question. Forget curing illness. That's an after the fact event, right? You're sick. Let me make you better. How about I may just make you better, period. Let's forget the illness part. Can we, at some point, can we understand the biome and can we manipulate a biome? Maybe risky, maybe beneficial. Can we manipulate a biome though to promote health? And in this one illness, we know we can. Right? In this one tiny little illness, we can put poop in someone it alters their biome, it increases the diversity of their biome, it, it makes their biome a less hospitable place for this bug, and that bug is cured. And isn't that incredible? That's, again, like I'm saying, that's, there's a much bigger world and everyone wants, wants this to be true in a, in a lot of ways. You know, we're doing this thing now called the Human Microbiome Project. You, you may remember there's the Human Genome Project, 30, 40 years, whatever it was. You know, we discovered DNA, we understood that we're coded, right? We are, we are coded by four base pairs and DNA is our or sort of genetic code, right? We are coded by genetics. And then we said, okay, we're going to sequence all the human genome and we call it the Human Genome Project and we're going to know every code in us. We did it. Fast forward to this. We're doing the Human Biome Project. We are cataloging the bugs that are in us. That's a giant project and a lot of data and computers and statisticians, but it's a doable product. We can, we can get a field guide to what's in us, right? We have the technology to do that. The next step of that is can we manipulate that again, for good and not evil, to promote someone's health. And I think that is really what's exciting about this. And that's what's driving an incredible amount of data, incredible amount of startups and entrepreneurs and people trying to, this is kind of the new, in my world, and it's the new wild west, are people trying to come up with sort of biome diagnostics, biome therapeutics. So Sabine's doing this great work, one of our, our colleagues. To, you can, again, you can catalog all this stuff, but the, the hard part is understanding how they work. It is not a list of bugs. We are so much more, and by the way, it's not just bacteria. We talk about bugs as if it's bacteria, right? But there are viruses in us, there are phages in us, there's fungi within us. There's a lot of fungome, that's a thing. A virome is a thing. We, we sort of assume it's bacteria, but in fact, that's not necessarily true. It may well be the other components. And it's also not just this catalog, right? It's, it's not just bird watching where you go out in the field and say, okay, there's a, there's a robin and there's a blue jay and there's a crow. It's, it's how do the robin and the blue jay and the crow live in this field and who feeds who and who eats who and who preys on who and who mates with who. And it's not just a, a, a guide. It's how these bugs live in this milieu and how they cohabitate. And, and it's incredibly complicated. It's far, far more complicated than I think. We would have liked it to be easy. List the bugs and we'd solve the problems. That ain't the answer, assuredly. Uh, no, it's multifactorial. That's amazing. Now, in the field of veterinary medicine, they've been doing 
similar kind of work with animals. Is this where the idea came from? The idea has been around for millennia, so, so the idea is not new. There's old Chinese medicine texts describing sort of a, a child with diarrhea and, and then drinking yellow soup, which we believe was some form of bacterial therapy in like the fourth century BC. So this is the, conceptually, there, there's sort of writings about this. Vets are not surprised by this. So this whole conversation I gave you about stool as therapy, vets, vets I don't think are surprised at that at all. First of all, animals eat poop, as a, some animals, as a natural, healthful behavior. For some animals, it's not gross. You may think it's gross when your dog eats another dog's poop. And a hundred plus years ago, there were reports of what vets call transphonation. That's actually the, they have a name for it, transphonation. We call it fecal transplant, but moving fauna from one place to another, transphonation. You know, horse A has diarrhea. You, you reach your hand up horse B's tush. You grab some of horse B's good, good horse stuff. You go back over to horse A and you shut it up horse A's tush and horse A gets better. That's published a hundred years ago. That's not news at all. There, that, there's ample data on that. that You can treat a number of animal illnesses with that concept. We have kind of created this sort of pushback on poops. So it's unthinkable to us to use as a therapy, not to the vets. Vets are, sure. Here's another kind of fun fact, I guess, for me is um, I would have thought this was the grossest thing ever, and who wants to talk about this? Turns out people want to talk about this, and it's, you know, we use the term scatologic humor, right? Poop can be funny, and poop humor is funny, and, and you know, when my son was 12, he laughed at, at farts and poop jokes, and we're intrigued by it, I'll tell you that. For this one little illness, C. diff and poop, there's a thousand other illnesses that are really boring that no one's writing a news story on because it's just another illness, but then because we're using poop has kind of gotten lay attention and media attention, certainly. The biome is so complicated, you could be an expert in the math of the biome, right? The stats of the biome. It is an incredibly complicated thing. We need incredibly heavy computer details, data. It's a, it's a data hog, and you need super smart people just to tease it out. And again, that's just to catalog. That's just to catalog. And then when you start to do, as I was talking about before, try to understand the interrelationships, it gets staggeringly complicated. That's interesting. All right. Now, you're also a world expert on diverticular disease. Can you please tell us about that and tell us about your work in that area as a world expert? Sure. It's the polar opposite of my biome fecal transplant world. Two-thirds of the elderly in this country have diverticulosis, have these pockets in our colons. That's what diver a diverticulum, singular. Diverticulosis is having these pockets. Diverticulitis is when they get infected. Two-thirds of our elderly have that, but nobody wants to talk about that because it is the least sexy thing on the face of the earth compared to bugs and poop and fecal transplant. So I give a whole lot more lectures on poop because people find that sexy. Truth is, diverticular disease is super common. It's, it's the prevalence is very, very high, cause a lot of illness. I think in some recent data set from the government, it was sort of the fifth most common reason for, I think, admission to the hospital. So it's, it's yeah. common, but, it, but who wants to talk about it? It's, it's boring. So like the story with C. diff where someone asked me to do that 20 years ago, 1998, I was less than two years in my professional world. And someone I worked with at the time at the University of Miami was asked to write the national guidelines on diverticulitis. And I don't think there was anyone else besides him who gave a damn about it. And he asked me to work with him and write this paper. I did not, at the time, have any experience at all. I was just kind of being in the right place at the right time. And the right person basically said, here, help me do this. But I wrote the paper. And, you know, if you write the paper, you, you become the guy. Now, fast forward 20 years later. Um, this was 20-something years ago. In 2015, I wrote the next version of that, and now I was someone with experience and research and bona fides. I was really a kid in, in 99, but by the time 2015 rolls around, we, we redid them. In essence, we did we updated those 1999 guidelines, and we do that in our world, right? You, you put a bunch of experts in a room together, you say, what's the state of the art? And then you come out with a document that says, this is what we think is the, the state of the art. So I, I was lucky enough to do that again in, in 2015, and I still work in that world a lot. Again, it's a lot, it's a lot less visible than the poop transplant world. The fecal transplant world is a, a visible one. Uh, but, but in fact, I spend a lot of my academic time educating, working on, researching, writing about uh, these, little, these little pockets, which two out of three old people you know have, so they should care about them. And John 
me about treatments and kind of progress with treating and handling diverticular disease. Well, I'm one of the guys, one of the people who said you don't have to avoid seeds and nuts. So, you know, there's this whole conception, you've probably heard that. Yeah. Every diverticulitis, you couldn't have sesame seeds and poppy seeds and peanuts and popcorn. In our 99 guidelines, we looked at the data on that. And the data would not suggest that that was true, but we said very actively, you know, there's no science behind that, FYI. 2015, we actually did a much more rigorous scientific paper, and we looked at that data very closely. And not only did the data not say you should avoid those things, the data said avoiding those things was bad for you. Because those are good things. Seeds and nuts are healthy, a part of a healthy diet. And people who are avoiding those things might have even done a little worse. So in our guideline in 2015, bullet point four out of 12, or I don't remember the, the number, I think four out of 12, says very overtly, there ain't no reason to tell that Grandma Minnie anymore that she can't have seeds and nuts and popcorn. We should stop telling patients that they can't have a strawberry or a poppy seed bagel because they're worried about these seeds getting stuck in their diverticula. So I'm the guy who, who permitted, we are the group that said, yes, you can have seeds and nuts, go have, go have seeds and nuts. And we said it out loud and wrote it down and, and hopefully people will read it. And it, the problem is we're kind of a, an uninteresting illness. So I don't know if anybody's reading it, but, but if they do, it says very clearly, you can have poppy seed bagels. Well, I'll bet you a good portion of people listening to this video are very familiar with it. And if they don't have it themselves, they have a family member who does have it or has suffered an attack of diverticulitis. Anything in particular that you would recommend and put out there to people? to safeguard themselves. All the things that are good advice health-wise anyway are good for diverticulitis. So it's actually kind of an easy one. A high fiber diet. Now there's a million reasons to be on a, on a diet higher in you know, fruits and vegetables and, and fiber and lower in fats and red meats. And, you know, heart disease and cholesterol and colon cancer and a whole bunch of other things. But diverticular disease is a good one. Clearly populations that have a higher fiber, low fat diet have less diverticular disease and less complications. Vegetarians have less diverticular disease than non-vegetarian. A, a vegetarian diet is typically, well, obviously has no meat in it, typically fairly high in fiber compared to sort of omnivores diets. So that's a good thing. Not smoking, clearly. Um, losing weight, well, obesity is a risk factor for diverticular disease. Maybe the one important thing to reviewers is avoiding non-steroidal, Advil, Motrin, Ibuprofen, Aleve, all of these these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, or NSAIDs as we sometimes call them. We know they cause ulcers, that's old news. We know that they cause stomach ulcers, that we've known that for 50 years. But now it's clear they cause diverticulitis and diverticular bleeding too. They're just bad for our intestines, period. From mouth to anus, non-steroidals are not good for our guts with sort of ongoing, long-term uh, non-steroidal use. Things, lose weight, exercise more, avoid non-steroidals, eat a high fiber diet, boom. But those are all good for you anyway, so. What does the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories do to the gut? They inhibit the gut's ability to repair itself. So our guts get injured or like ulcers happen all the time, basically we lose cells, but we have our own mechanisms to replace and repair. The, where the, the mechanisms of action of, non, of traditional non-steroidal cyclooxygenase is they inhibit the step of repair. So if you're taking a drug that doesn't let you repair, your injuries get worse. That's the sort of short version of that. That's very nicely and simply explained. That was good. We want to keep viewers engaged and learn from what you have to say. And I think you did a great job of that. Dr. Stolman, thank you so much for joining me today. All the information you have shared is fascinating, interesting, and you explain things so nicely. It's very understandable for everybody. Thank you everyone for listening to Hibbert Health. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel and you will get notification when new videos are uploaded. Thank you very much.